It's my privilege to welcome you to our parents' weekend worship service. We so much wish that we were together in this sanctuary for our regular uh, parents' weekend with all of the festivities and the fun that goes into that weekend. We have missed not having parents on campus. It is one of the important weekends of the year and one that we look forward to, but unfortunately just no safe way for us to do that this year. So we are sorry that we're not together, but you will hear in this service get a taste of the talents and the abilities and the skills of the young people at GCA. And we are grateful that you're with us on this day to worship. And uh, we pray that you'll be blessed. I'd like to especially Thank our leadership team for, from parents in support of GCA. PSGCA is our parent organization that exists to help strengthen the school, to make sure that the experience that your young people are having at GCA is positive and enduring. Uh, this is the 19th year of the existence of parents in support of GCA, and we want to encourage your involvement our leadership team will be working on making contact with parents and reaching out for more involvement throughout this school year, and so watch for that. I especially want to thank our leadership team and Jeff and Shauna Wood, uh, the couple who lead our leadership team for PSGCA for all that they do to strengthen Georgia Cumberland Academy. It's the partnership of parents and faculty and staff and students working together that helps us be the best that we can be. So thank you for your involvement in PSGCA. Thank you for all, to all of those who have worked hard to bring this worship service together. And uh, I pray that you will be blessed as you participate in this worship experience. Thank you. Lord, thank you for the blessing of congregation. During this uncertain time, we have been protected from sickness, violence, hate, and all the iniquities of this earth. As a campus, we are so grateful that we still have the opportunity to be together and worship you. Thank you for being a constant in our lives. Even when we undergo difficulties, you never fail to be at our right hand when we call. During these times, the most beautiful waterfall can only happen in the steepest place in our lives. Thank you for your patience, Lord, and help us to grow and be more like you. In your name, amen.
United. Well, I personally believe that love and laughter keeps our family family united apart from God because we like to play with each other and joke around a lot, but we also love each other so much. So I think that's what keeps our family united. Yes, that is true. Would you like to say something? Yes, um, we can keep uh, united as a family in, in reading the, the, the Word of God and prayer together and be respect with uh, each one another. Amen. Of course, we also are part of the huge family, right, Martha? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. How do we keep our relationship with God and church together? Well, um, in these <coughs> unusual times, um, it's harder to be together in person, but thankfully we have the internet, so we can have Zoom and we can share with each other um, on the computer together and we can also call each other and just keep praying for each other is also a huge help as well. Amen. That's what we would love to share with you all. And I hope you all are keeping your families united together in Jesus Christ and have a wonderful Thanksgiving Day too. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Happy Thanksgiving.
So Pastor Woods asked us the question, how does our relationship with God affect the unity of our family? What do you think? So for us, it's more of we help the local school community and help people by serving, by helping others, like doing the food pantry potluck or just helping other people that need help. Yeah, I think we find a lot of unity in our family around food because we enjoy eating together and cooking together and inviting people over to enjoy food with us. And I think God, definitely Jesus did that when he was here on earth. He enjoyed eating and being with people. Do you have like a favorite memory of when you were serving food or working with food? Hmm. I probably would say in potluck, dealing with multiple kinds of foods that are international at Marietta. Yeah. We had a lot of fun working with with a lot of different potlucks. And it's neat to meet people because it's not just unity of our family, but it's unity of our church community as well. Um, It's neat to, to work together to serve each other. In the beginning, God created the world, a world in perfect harmony with God's law. But Satan entered that garden, and Adam and Eve challenged God's plan by eating from the forbidden tree. Thus entered the seeds of sin and rebellion. Man's focus changed from fellowship with God to the fulfillment of his own selfish desires. Those selfish desires influenced all decisions Humanity was altered, and our sinful nature turned friends against friends and turned brother against brother. Over time, the world changed. The seeds of sin grew and spread until today our world bears little resemblance to God's perfect creation. Violence theft and domestic abuse fill the media headlines and devastate victims' lives. Satan's goal is to pervert that which God created. Hatred has replaced love. That hatred led to distinctions, distinctions not drawn by God where men and women are now not judged by their character, but by the color of their skin. Death, the wages of sin, comes for everyone, too often in terrible circumstances. Accidents, hunger, war, and disease claim lives every day. Innocent people face death when it is least expected. All mankind was made in God's image. Yet, in today's world, the lack of respect for basic human dignity causes division and strife. Instead of being united as God intended, the consequences of sin leave us with a nation and a world that is politically and socially divided. Life's new form now bears little resemblance to God's original plan. Yet, as Christians, we are called to live another way, to not be conformed to this world, but instead to be transformed through God's redeeming love. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Then God sent his one and only Son to redeem the world. Jesus suffered the consequences of sin just as we do, and worse suffering even to the point of death. 
but through his sacrifice, man is redeemed. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. Once again, man and God will live in perfect fellowship. GCA parents, faculty, and students. We are the Henderson family. I'm Johanna Henderson. I'm Kennedy Henderson. And I'm Eden Henderson. I'm Kiba Henderson. And I'm Jonathan Henderson. And today we'll be answering a few questions for you. First, I'd like to start to talk a little bit about how our relationship with God um, helps to bring our family together, helps to unify us. And really, we wouldn't have any unity without God. There are so many times when we're not unified. And actually, it was challenging to do this video because, you know, sometimes we're not always unified. But when we put God first in our lives and we spend time with him in worship, we have the opportunity to draw closer to him. And drawing closer to God brings us closer to each other, allowing us to have time to share testimony, to pray for each other and to allow God to help us through these very trying times because we're all under various stressors with all that's going on in the world right now. Um, to add on to that, um, with all these tough times, you know, that's going on right now with, you know, personal issues, uh, worldly issues, you know, COVID and everything else is going on. The one thing that I feel that holds our family together is love. Like personally, myself, I believe that uh, love holds us together because the love that I feel for my family is very strong, and I don't think anyone else could take that away. Um, I think that fellowship and um, time with our family is what keeps it us together, because you can't like be bonded with each other if you don't communicate and spend time with each other. I think that it's God that brings us together, and yeah, I really And, um, one of the other points um, to make is how can we then, um, as a school, church, as a family members, as a community, uh, be unified? Because there's so many things going against us um, in the world, and even in our own families, as we, you know, the, the devil puts so much strife and pits us against one another. So, what is it that will unify our families with our community and with our schools? And it's kind of the theme that we've all been talking about already. And that is, we all have to be unified in who is it who we believe in. And if Jesus Christ is our Savior and we have him in our heart, then I'm going to have my family's best interest at heart. I'm going to have my neighbor's best interest at heart, which is the community, the school, everyone around us. And if we all uh, take on that and view it that way, then I think it brings an automatic unity. And we see it so much in the Bible that God lets us know that, you know, if you're one, then there's nothing that can stop you if you're one in me. So God is definitely the, the glue that not only keeps our family together, but that can keep our schools, our community, and keep our world unified.
Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're really happy to be going through Parents Weekend, even though it looks a little bit different than it normally does. And even though we can't be here together, I'm glad we're able to connect in this kind of way. And I want to talk about being united. The theme that the essay chose for this year, the theme that we've been focusing on throughout the school year, and you know, this is one of those themes that it seemed so important when they chose it this summer. Uh, leading up into the school year, as we were thinking about the things our nation was undergoing, United seemed to be a really important theme, and it has not gone away. More than ever, there's this, this moment in our nation, in our communities, in our churches, where we just want to feel a sense of connection and unity. We don't want to be divide it anymore. You know, we just went through this election season. And of course, leading up into it, we knew like any other election that there would be a polarized thing taking place where there would be different camps that were formed. But going into the election, one of the things that really surprised me this year was how close everything was. It was a real nail biter of an election. No matter who you were voting for, whether you were interested or not interested, it just kept you at the edge of your seat, which in a normal kind of thing, like not a normal kind of political situation, but in any other kind of scenario, if this was the Super Bowl, if this was the World Series, this would be a great World Series. It would be a great, Super Bowl, because we would be so connected and we'd be thinking, this is such a great game. I don't know what the outcome is going to be. But of course, this wasn't the World Series that we went through. And the reality is, the reason why things were so close is because it was one more sign, one more piece of evidence that we found ourselves in a divided place where there's differing opinions. One group thinks that this is where the nation should go. One group thinks that this is where the nation should go. And of course, we see the need for unity in many different places as well. We see this happening in the conversations that we have with our friends, with our relatives. We see it happening in various kinds of problematic social situations. And we just want to see more of that in our lives. So the question is, where does God help us with this? Where do we find information about unity in the Bible? I want to look at the text that we're focusing on this year, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting with verse 10. And we'll go a bit beyond that for some more context. Paul writes this. He says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Now, what I like about this right away, when we read this from Paul, is we find immediately that we are called to be different. We have always struggled. This world has always struggled. Humanity has always struggled with divisions. 
way back there, 2,000 years ago when Paul's writing this, thousands of years before that, there have always been divisions. But Paul's saying here that there should be something different that we see in church communities where we can be not divided, but instead united. And the word for united here is talking about this idea of bringing together healing. Kind of like when a body has been ripped apart and it comes back together, it's been stitched back together and there's healing that takes place. That's the kind of unity Paul's referring to. And we know that there's been some divisions that we have all felt with different people in our lives. And Paul's saying we can have unity here. We can bring together the things that have been separated. Now, of course, what's Paul talking about? What's the scenario that he's addressing? We find out more about it as we we read on. Verse 11, for some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels. My dear brothers and sisters, some of you are saying, I am a follower of Paul, and others are saying, I follow Apollos, I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except for Crispus and Gaius, for now no one can say that they were baptized in my name. Oh yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus, but I don't remember baptizing anyone else, for Christ didn't send me to baptize but to preach the good news. Not with clever speech for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. He was sent there to preach the good news. Now, I love as Paul's writing this, or maybe he's dictating this. It seems like he's remembering things on the fly. I didn't baptize anybody. Wait, there was someone there. He's, he's kind of thinking on his feet about the scenario that he's talking about, but we clearly see what's going on. That this church that he's addressing has been divided because they're getting divided into these different factions about what they believe and who they follow and who they're most loyal to. And it's different from the kind of factions that we have right now, different from the kind of divides. But the solution is still the same. Paul is saying, I want you to have a united focus. I want you to be of one mind, to be of one mind that will and one purpose, and that will change the way that you relate to each other. It doesn't matter which camp you form, when you are united in mind and purpose, it will change. Now, now what are we talking about? What is Paul talking about when he's urging us to have this kind of unity in mind and purpose? Does this mean that we are to be like completely identical in our beliefs? Completely identical? Are we supposed to convince other people to believe like we do? Is that what he means? Of course not, right? Like unity is not uniformity. But at the same time, there is something that we need to agree upon. There is something that we need to agree upon in our mind, the things that we believe, as well as the things that we do in our purposes. So what is that and what does that look like? Now first, let me back up one more time and talk about the kinds of divisions that we have. Because what our conversation has been dominated with lately are the kind of divisions that we see on the news. The kind of divisions, like I talked about earlier, that we see in the nation. The kind of divisions that are these macro divisions that we worry about. But the truth is, the kind of divisions that we should probably be paying closest attention to, the kind of divisions that we should be paying most attention to, are the very things that we experience in our lives, our day-to-day lives the kind of actual relationships that we have. In other words, are there divisions that we find in our homes? Are there divisions that we find with our relatives, with our church communities? Because that's really where the rubber meets the road. It's not so much about the different things that we believe on the national level. It's really about how does my Christian walk look like in my house, at my job, at my church? What does that kind of unity look like? And I think the answer is when we focus on the unity of mind and purpose, the things that we believe in, the things that we do, it will change the way that we relate to people. And I think we see that by looking at the life of Jesus. Now, before we go into that, let me tell you, Quick little thing. Remember years ago, way back when, when you could go to Facebook and Facebook was, was kind of in its infancy. This is a time when 
It wasn't just us old people that were on Facebook, but there was a broad group of young people on Facebook as well. This is before we were worried about the misinformation campaigns going on on Facebook. It's before we had to worry about all the toxicity as people disagreed about different things and ranted on Facebook. And instead, you would go to Facebook, and it was just a place where people would share interesting things, maybe cute cat videos of a cat playing a piano. You know, whatever it was, they would share these different things. Well, back then, I remember years ago, I used to like going onto Facebook, and I would see something that was uh, like a collection, a compilation video called People Are Awesome. Perhaps you remember this. This was way back when, and you would see these compilation videos of people doing amazing things. Um, gymnastic things, like extreme sports things, things where you looked at this and you said, there's no way someone could actually do this, but they would do it, and it would be amazing, and this compilation of people are awesome. And I used to love watching these videos. It was fun to see these extreme things people could do, the talent that they had. But then, fast forward time a little bit, I enjoyed those videos, and then I found there was another set of videos that I liked even more. And these videos were called fail videos, or there was a specific one that was pumping out them called fail army videos. And this was the complete opposite. It was people trying to do extreme things, but not succeeding. They would always fail. They would break themselves. They would get hurt. And I, and I found that this was actually better to watch. I enjoyed this even more. It was more fun to watch these kind of videos, which I think probably tells you something about me, something that I shouldn't be proud of, but that I could enjoy watching the failure of these people more than the success of these people. And so the question is, what does that say about me? And, and I think it says something that sometimes, and not to read too much into this, but sometimes, we don't feel for people the way that we should. That sometimes when we're looking at people, we're more concerned about our entertainment and we're more concerned about the things that we can get from them than actually thinking about who they are and what they are in that situation. And I don't think it's just me. Out of curiosity today, I, I went ahead and I looked up to see if these videos were still online. And sure enough, there's YouTube channels that continue to pump these out. And interestingly enough, there's a lot of people who still like the People Are Awesome videos. There's 3.5 million subscribers currently. It's a huge channel. But then I went over and I looked at the Fail Army uh, YouTube channel, and there's 14.6 million subscribers. Way more people like watching people in defeat than people succeeding and prospering. Which makes me wonder if maybe what our nation actually has is a lack of empathy. Because of course, empathy is the ability to understand and share feelings with another. And when I'm watching people fail, I'm not actually feeling their feelings, I'm just deriving pleasure from what they're going through. And so it makes me think about the Bible. There's a word in the Bible, in the New Testament, that is probably the closest word that we have to empathy. And this is from Jesus. We see it most clearly in Jesus' life. And the, the Greek word for this is splanknitomai. And it's only used a handful of time, about 12 times in the New Testament. And every time but three of them is used for describing a response of Jesus, where Jesus is moved with, and it will usually say in most translations, he was moved with compassion when he saw the people around him. The other three times that we see it used in the New Testament, it's being used to, to describe, like in a parable perhaps, when Jesus is telling a story, to describe a Christ-like figure in that parable. My favorite one being in the parable of the prodigal son. When the son returns to the father, it says that he was moved with compassion. He saw his son a long ways off, and he was filled with love and compassion, love and splanknitomai when he saw his son, love and empathy when he saw his son, because he could feel that what his son had been through, and his response was to run to his son, because he was moved with this kind of compassion. And I feel like this idea, this idea of Jesus being an empathetic person, person, a Jesus being a person that's full, filled with compassion, who feels the pain, who feels the suffering, who recognizes what people are going through, and then has a, not only an inward response, 
but an outward action in response to that feeling where he runs to that son. I feel like this captures the idea of what Paul is talking about. That we're a people that have been called to be of the same mind and the same purpose. People who are united in that kind of empathetic response to the people around us. And then people who then act on that feeling, who act on that response. The more we follow Jesus, the closer we get to him, perhaps the more we'll start to feel this ourselves. Perhaps the more that we'll start to set aside differences. And those differences might just simply be the way that we see our kids at home and the things that they're going through and we just can't understand what they're doing. Those differences could just simply be putting aside the the political differences that we might have with Uncle Joe or Aunt Carol. But whatever it is, we, we see the people for who they are. We see them as children of God, sons and daughters of God. And we feel compassion. We feel empathy for whatever it is that they're going through. And we feel called to love them the way Jesus loves them and to act on that love. May we be more like this. May we be more united because we've been filled with the love of Jesus as we feel the needs of the people around us. Let's pray. God, may we be more like you. May you fill our hearts with compassion for the people around us, whether they're our kids, whether they're our parents, whether they're our church community, our work community, or bigger and broader than that, may we just simply see people as your creation and love them like you, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come together, even though we are not together, to come together united in worshiping you, the God of this universe. We praise you and thank you for being the God of this universe. We praise you and thank you for your love for us and that you sent your son Jesus to die for us. And Lord, I wanna pray a special prayer 
on every single GCA student. We are so thankful for each and every one of them and that you would just continue to bless and guide them. I wanna pray a special prayer for all the parents that are, that are represented here at GCA. I just pray a special blessing on them that you would give them strength and courage and that you would lead them and guide them and that they may continue to look to you each and every day. Lord, please help us to be faithful until the day comes or we can all be together in one place, worshiping you. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Testify, you know. 